so I'm here with Harry. Um, I met Harry back in 2011 uh, at a benefit for John Coots, a drummer who just passed away. Harry played with uh, Kevin Burrich and Paul Wheeler. And after it was over, I went backstage, I was taking photos, and I just asked Harry, would he mind if I filmed him again? And ever since, Harry's contacted me whenever he's got a great band with the best musicians around. And I'm just going to ask Harry a few things about um, what he's doing now and then back in the 60s. So Harry, what have you been doing, say, the last year? Well, mostly Mitchell Anderson and a few solo gigs with my band. It's kept me busy enough, so I'm quite happy with that. And you've just done the Blues Festival down in Threadbay? That's right, yeah, that was with my band and uh, we had some great gigs. No, no gigs where there wasn't a lot of enthusiasm for the great talents of Mitchell Anderson because he's, he's my number one uh, sidekick. And I filmed you last year at the Sydney Blues and Roots Festival. That was another great gig with Guy Pritchard. Yeah, well, that was a great festival, uh, and we had a good band there, always. Luckily enough, I getting to an age where all the people I work with are all friends and uh, people I admire as musicians. And, of course, Kevin Burrich. I mean, you've played with Kevin for years. Yeah, you? over 30 years, and, I mean, Kevin never fails to put on a killer show, that's for sure. With Paul Wheeler. And Paul's just about my favourite drummer, you know. Yeah. You know, he does everything... Like, I try and drag him into everything that I get. I don't know, most of the gigs that Paul's doing now are ones I've dragged him into. Yeah. And he's uh, slotted in beautifully always. Uh, he's a very uh, articulate, powerful drummer. And now I want to talk about the 60s. Now, you were born in Graz, in Austria? Graz. Graz. Graz, Austria, yeah. That's Arnold Schwarzenegger's hometown as well. All right. So, um... My mother actually sent him a letter of congratulations to Los Angeles when he, when he became America. Yeah, governor. Yeah. So you're very proud. Oh, right. A fellow Grazian. <laughs> so were you already playing bass when you come to Australia? Or? No, I came here seven years old. Right. Speaking no English and I learned it within six months. And basically I uh, discovered the shadows with Hank B. Marvin, right. which just blew my mind really because the sound of that Stratocaster of Hank B. Marvin is still unequal today for its clean tone and uh, that was my introduction and then I had a newspaper stand on Newtown Station. I ran the whole newspaper stand at, hmm. at uh, 15 and that's how I got the money to see you get my ticket for the Beatles. Because oh, right. so, uh, they're a big influence with you aren't they? They were, they definitely and always will be. And so uh, imagine going to see the Beatles, you standing there, think, well, that's not a really bad profession, standing up there and having girls scream at you. It's sort of, I thought, I'm going to try a bit harder at this. So, this <laughs> so is, I got more serious. That's not even 64, isn't it? 64, yeah. That, that was uh, basically uh, when I thought, oh, I'll get a bit more serious. This is a bit more than just strumming a few chords. And so from then on, I, I, I was playing lead guitar all in all those days and uh, basically doing all those Jeff Beck's uh, Ever Under Sideways Down and Beck's Bolero and all that mm. and Hendrix hit and I managed to do one run playing lead guitar with Johnny Young when he had his big hits and straight after that I basically got offered a gig playing bass and I really never sort of came off the bass after that was with the, the Dave Miller set, who had a hit back in uh, 1967, Mr. Guy Fawkes. So I did that for a while with John Robinson. I, I met John Robinson uh, a lot at Nicholson's in the city. He, he was later to become our first heavy metal guitar hero with Blackfeather, but when I met him, he was a crew cut Hank Marvin freak like me. Mm -hmm. So all we did was talk shadows at the beginning and when uh, Dave Miller wanted to form a band, we, we did uh, a few gigs and realised that the guitar player we had wasn't up to scratch. So I said to Dave Miller, listen, I know this fellow John Robinson, uh, you should get him in on guitar. So he came in and joined and from the rest is history in the sense that from, from that gig, John turned that into years later with Blackfeather. He, from being a Hank Marvin crew cut guy, he was full on long hair, Clapton and 
freaking everybody out with these extended solos. So that was uh, basically 1967, 68 I formed a band which included Roger Frampton, Tony Hicks from Backdoor, Alan Marshall singing and we played Caesars in place so we're quite a, a fusion type band for its day which was amazing for I'm not used to playing I'm basically a soul funk bass player but that was that was my next band and then I joined the house band at Checkers nightclub 1969 from there which back then we got the jam with Billy Preston and a few fantastic people a few guys from the Hollies and it was a great gig and from Checkers I went in to become the the um, stage bass player for Hair, which was above the whole, it's, you were in full view of the audience. So that was 1969 with Hair. Straight after Hair, I got offered the gig with Jeff and John and the Copper Wine, and we recorded Teach Me How to Fly and a few other great things. And that was probably the first really powerful gig that I'd ever been involved with, where it was original music and with an amazing front man who could sing like nobody and Wendy Saddington of course was the other lead vocalist which was we had we had the vocal side totally covered so I mean we really uh, took advantage of that and turned that into a monster band and from then on comes the 70s so uh, quite a full-on few years where I was basically a pretty average player in the sense that all I had was some energy but I didn't have any chops or in those early days because no one did there was no YouTube to learn stuff off so I basically each year found myself getting more and more serious about cleaning up my act and getting more finesse more keeping the power but making it more dynamic so spent years doing that slowly building up until the 70s hit with all the LSD and everything and that was when I really started to take flight in the sense that Sly and the Family Stone had hit and for me uh, Sly and the Family Stone and James Brown were my main, apart from the Motown thing which has always been a big thing, were my main influences. So I'd spend, I'd spend two days without sleep just practicing, all day, all night just because I realised where I was at and realised where the people I was listening to were at and it was pretty scary so it made you feel either like get with the program or get out so I got with the program and just so I actually got good enough to get some really good gigs from then on seriously haven't stopped since then. <laughs>